It's easy to guess what a band gets up to when they're not making music or going on tour. Partying? Attending to a family? Not going to parties because that's not your lifestyle, so you play Xbox while your bandmates are getting high? I spend a lot of time at home. I don't go out much. I don't usually, I'm too inconvenienced to even go bother with parking at a show that size. Like 15,000 people? That's a traffic jam. I'm gonna stay home and mess. Well, what exactly does an animated band get up to during their downtime? If you guessed going on pirate adventures and starting cults, you're right. Gorillas is an animated act that has so much lore built around them. Is it the most thought out lore? No. Is some of the lore garbage? Yes. Either way, I'm going to chronicle their story into several part videos as thoroughly as I can without disrupting the pace too much. The way Gorillaz is set up is in phases, with the main studio album dictating what phase we're in. This video covers most of the band's backstory up until the end of phase 1, where the video will pick up with phase 2, or Demon Days. That's enough explaining, let's get into it. Uh, hello, I'm Sudi, I'm the singer, and I play the pianos, and I need the toilet. Hello, mum. On June 6, 1966, a woman gave birth to one Murdoch Alphonse Nichols at a halfway house for the sick. He was soon abandoned in a crib at his father, Sebastian Nichols' doorsteps. Murdoch was found after a long night of drinking at the pub, with a crow perched on his crib. Murdoch's father was mean to the young boy, forcing him to do performances at the pub even though he didn't want to, fearing his wrath. He was forced onto these Are You A Star shows to make tiny amounts of money. If he didn't, his father would abuse the young boy. Because of this, Murdoch vowed to never get on stage under someone else's direction. During school, none of the teachers or other students liked him. A former student named Tony Chopper was a bully that Murdoch had, calling him names like Nerdock. One day, Murdoch stood up to his bully, calling him a useless, bloated, backward waste of space who would probably end up getting a job holding up a for sale sign on the corners of streets, only to then himself get fired and replaced by a bucket of soil. This caused Tony to punch Murdoch, breaking his nose for the first time. Murdoch got a lot of his music taste from his brother, Hannibal, which consisted of dub and punk. But Murdoch's first true love was black metal, which Hannibal did not like at all. One altercation caused Hannibal to break Murdoch's nose a second time. It was around this time that Murdoch also got a do-it-yourself Satanist kit, which you will soon see will quickly define his life. Even though he studied other cultures in college, Murdoch decided to become not only a musician, but the front of the biggest band in the world. To do this, he made a deal with the big man down below. Murdoch sold his soul and changed his middle name from Alphonse to Faust and in return he got the devil's bass, El Diablo. At first he went from small job to small job, like Grave Digger to Christmas Santa, but eventually he made his own band called Patchouli Clark, or however you pronounce that. And then after that failed, Kiss and Make Up, then Bullworker, the stupid name gang, etc, etc. One thing stayed consistent to all the bands and why they failed. That was Murdoch's crow screeching vocals. If he wanted to have the biggest band in the world, he was going to need a singer. Stuart Harold Pot, or Stu Pot, was born on May 23, 1978, and from a young age, music and films were a huge part of the young boy's life. When Stu was 11, he fell out of a tree, landing on his head and knocking out all of his hair. When it grew back, the color was a vibrant blue. This is where Stu's eventual addiction to painkillers began, for his mother was a nurse and had an unlimited supply. However, music isn't what Stu wanted to be in life, for at one point he wanted to be a storm chaser and then a painter. But this was all about to change, because Murdoch had other plans. D-Day, August 15th, 1997. It's just another day for Stuart. He's at his job at Uncle Norm's Organ Emporium when Murdoch decides to act on a heist. He's gonna drive straight through the front window, steal as much as he can, and drive away. However, in this robbery, Murdoch drove straight into Stewart's head, 
fracturing his left eye and leaving him in a catatonic state. Murdoch was arrested and was sentenced to 30,000 hours of community service, along with 10 hours of taking care of Stewart. But instead of actually taking care of him, Murdoch bullied and abused the comatose boy. Kicking, punching, dunking, nothing affected Stewart until one day they took it too far. Murdoch was at a car park showing off his 360 degree donuts trying to impress the ladies when BAM! He hit a curb going 90. This sent Stewart flying through the windshield at 70 miles an hour, skidding his face for half a mile. But then he got up. His other eye was fractured, but he was described as a blue-haired, black-eyed god. Murdoch immediately knew that this was his new front man. It didn't help that he had 8th grade piano skills and the voice of an angel. Murdoch gave him the name 2D for the two dents in his head from the accidents, of course. Next up, Murdoch needed a drummer. Russell Hobbs was born on June 3rd, 1975, and unlike Murdoch and 2D who were born in the UK, Russell was born in Brooklyn, New York. When he was younger, his friends were killed in a drive-by shooting, with his friend Dell dying instantly right beside of him. Russell recounts that he saw the Grim Reaper for the first time that day. It was also then that the spirits of his dead friends got sucked into Russell like a vacuum cleaner, turning his eyes a silky white. Russell used to go to a private school in New York, but he was quickly kicked out due to the students getting mauled and Russell growing twice his size and going on rampages. After these rampages, he would leave his signature mark. Russell Hobbs was here, written in blood. Little did Russell know, he was possessed by a much bigger demon even before his friends were gunned down. Getting kicked out sent Russell into an anxiety-induced coma where he was out for four years until Father Marin exorcised the demon out of him. That's when he came around. Russell went back to school, this time to a public school, and it was here where he learned about hip-hop. Russell claims that hip-hop saved his life and his soul. He was happy, but this didn't last long, however, for his parents sent him to England for safety. He got a job at Big Rick Black's record shack when Murdoch found him, put a bag over his head, and took him to where the band resides, Kong Studios. Russell says that the music was so good that he decided to stay. Plus, Murdoch had the hip-hop machine, a legendary device that had every beat known to man. Russell added a lot to the band, bringing a love of hip-hop, world music, funk, dub, and more. The only thing that they needed was a guitar player. Luckily, they had one in 2D's girlfriend, Paula Cracker. That is, until Russell found Paula in cubicle number three of Kong Studios' bathroom with Murdoch. Russell broke Murdoch's nose a further five times and fracturing it eight. This caused Paula to get kicked out, meaning the band needed another guitar player. Murdoch put an ad in the NME saying that a global phenomenon seeks a guitarist for world domination. No hippies. The moment the ad was placed, there was a knock at the door. No one was there, except for a 10-foot box. But then out came Noodle, playing a guitar riff that sounded like 200 demons screaming in Arabic. It was beautiful. She ended the riff with a karate kick and sang a single word, Noodle. She had a joyful approach to life and amnesia. This didn't deteriorate the band, however. She fit right in. She gave off a pure love that everyone appreciated. Plus, she made fun of Murdoch a lot, which Russell greatly appreciated. All the band needed was a name. Musically, Murdoch wanted to swing around the jungle with his ass out, so he thought Gorillaz was a perfect name. Murdoch bought a disposable camera, took some pictures, and sent them to record labels along with their first song, Ghost Train. And immediately, the phone started ringing. On November 5th, 1998, they played their first concert at the Camden Brown House, and the next day, they were signed to Parlophone by one Mr. Whiffy Smiffy. They threw a party that erupted into a food fight that was so violent it knocked 2D's tonsils out. Mr. Smithy also introduced the band to some old school backup for guidance. The singer of Blur, Damon Albarn, who immediately had an altercation with Murdoch about his boots that made Murdoch humiliated. And then on November 31st, 1998, Gorillaz start recording their first album. 
their self-titled Jane Birkin, she makes me feel all funny in the never regions and me pink bits and yeah. The recording of this album was very unusual. Coming from Murdoch's demos, the studio was alive, but something was missing. Damon Albarn recommended working with Dan the Automator to produce the album. Dan was immediately impressed and knew where to take them, starting with replacing Murdoch's vocals he improvised with Clint Eastwood with a rap. This summoned Dell out of Russell to deliver a career-defining rap on the track. Dan then decided to take the band to Jamaica to finish the album because of the dub influences and to give the album much needed optimism. With the album done, it's time to shoot some promotional videos. They almost had to cancel the Tomorrow Comes Today video because Murdoch fell out of a tree landing on his back. But they persisted and got director Paulo Skin Basio to direct. But the band was not happy with his performance. Because of this, the band got Jamie Hewlett and Matt Wakem to direct, and they were blown away. The visual side of Gorillaz would from now on be handled by Jamie Hewlett. Due to the band not fully wanting to commit to the animated front, Matt filmed London's nightlife while the band was filmed elsewhere and layered over top of the footage. On December 27, 2000, the Tomorrow Comes Today EP was released, but the band wasn't going to slow down. For next would be one of the band's most defining songs. Over the next 16 weeks, the band made the video for Clint Eastwood, and this was their breakthrough. Released on March 5th, 2001, it peaked at number 3 on the charts just 6 days later, and it went on to win numerous awards in the UK, Europe, and the USA. Gorillaz released their self-titled album on March 26, 2001, with it entering the charts on April 1st, peaking at number 3. Gorillaz weren't doing so bad themselves in the US either. The first week of the album being released, it sold at least 150,000 copies in the first week, peaking at number 14 on the US charts. After releasing another single, 192000, the band flies to Japan to do some shows. The band was immediately greeted by adoring fans, but there was a melancholic feeling that hit Noodle. She felt like an outsider and began to have disturbing dreams. When going home, Gorillaz collaborator Damon Albarn was disappointed because some people thought that Gorillaz was a side project for him when it was so much more. So to reintroduce themselves to Japan, Gorillaz released the B-Sides album, G-Sides, which worked really well over there. Gorillaz thought they won an award but didn't, went on tour in the UK, and released another single, Rock the House. They also made some sketches that showed what it was like to be a part of the band in six Gorilla Bites. And then there was a news reporter that tried to find the hidden truth behind the animated band. This goes nowhere after meeting up with Damon Albarn and Jamie Hewlett, where they had some misleading answers. Were you trying to make a statement with the creation of the Gorillas? What we're trying to do is replace order with chaos. What does that mean? It means that I, I find delivery of uh, misinformation to be as valid as the delivery of information. Where was the band during all this? They refused to be in it because they saw it as a waste of time. After this, they went on tour in the US, which included summoning and dealing with a demon boy. And then the tour ended in Mexico. With the shows done, instead of going back to Kong Studios to make some new music, the band moved to LA to look over some potential film scripts. At first, it was great. Non-stop partying, mingling with famous people, sneaking into Playboy Mansion, getting kicked out of Playboy Mansion. Uh, three months go by, and there was no work getting done. They don't even have a director, so they rushed to get one, and the one they chose was terrible. He had a script called, Whoops, There Goes My Career, and the script was so off the walls that it was ridiculous. Plus, the only time the band left LA was to play at the Isle of MTV Festival. It was here where Murdoch was handed a release to sign. It was their album, but remixed by a trio called the Space Monkeys. Basically, 2D left Kong Studios unlocked, thinking that they were going to be gone for only three weeks, not months. The three Cosmic Monkeys waltzed their way into the studio, stole the master tapes for their album, and remixed it. They called it Like I Come Home, and was an attempt to contact the jungle mothership that they were booted from. The band returned to LA to continue making their film, and the script was completely changed. 
Everyone was extremely upset. So upset that they decided to get a hotel room and write their own film. Everyone but Russell, who was growing impatient with the situation, was excited. This should only take two days. Two days turned into a month, and everyone was getting fed up with each other. 2D kept throwing out ideas that were already made, like Jaws and Elevator Pitch. But it was when 2D suggested Jack Black could play Murdoch that Murdoch snapped. He grabbed 2D by the throat and was strangling the life out of him. Noodle got into the fight, but it was when Russell knocked Murdoch in the head that he fell to the ground like a stringless puppet. That was it. That was the line. Murdoch had been humiliated by his own bandmate. Spouting threats to 2D and talking about how he carried the band, Murdoch left the room. Gorillas were over. This turned out to be a much bigger video than I was expecting. Originally, this was supposed to be phases one through three, but I wanted it to be as thorough as I could while keeping up a good pace. Because of this, I had to leave out a lot of small, yet funny details that I know don't go anywhere, like Murdoch having an arch nemesis named Dr. Wurzel, who stole his Winnebago and posted pictures of him in it on top of Big Ben, on the Death Star, and baked in a cake. Watch. Next time I'll be looking at phases 2 and 3 and answering some unanswered questions like what's Noodle's backstory? What brought the band back together after that fight? Why is Murdoch turning green? Well, that's apparently just how he tans. So be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss when that video is released. Until then, I'll see you later.